Welcome to the fifth episode of the Unlearning Podcast. My name is Ashley Lynn Hankst, and I'm so grateful you hit play today and that you are allowing me the chance to walk with you on your journey of unlearning. I want to get right to it because we have a lot to go through. Today's podcast is all about Eve. Many women, including myself, grew up in the evangelical culture and were greatly influenced by a theological concept called complementarianism. A really loving way of describing complementarianism is that it's it's the idea that men and women complement each other and that their relationship is to reflect the relationship of Christ and the church. Complementarianism takes a literal view of a section of Paul's description of gender roles in marriage. Notice I didn't say Jesus's view because Jesus never said anything about gender roles. He just told people to stop using their religion to get divorced. Paul's theology on gender and marriage is pretty specific. In this first letter to the Corinthians, he wrote, For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God. This is what Paul believed. But woman is the reflection of man. Verse 8. Indeed, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for the sake of women, but woman for the sake of man. End quote. A literal interpretation of this is the basis for prioritizing the needs and concerns of men over women. Many evangelicals believe and preach that males are the very image and reflection of God, and females are the reflection of of males and that women are made for men to serve them, please them, and help them. This kind of theology is very acceptable in evangelical churches today. Complementarianism also draws from Paul's letters to the Ephesians where he wrote in chapter 5 verse 22 and following, wives be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the savior. Verse 24, just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything subject to their husbands. In theory, this could be a good thing, right? Watching men protect and provide for their wives the way Jesus did. But a literal interpretation of Paul and only Paul's words on gender turns into patriarchy and the subjugation of women to the margins. Authors and speakers such as Elizabeth Elliot, Carolyn Mahaney, Nancy Lee DeMoss Walgamuth, these women have done so much work in teaching evangelical women how to understand and live out complementarianism. You might have read Elizabeth Elliot's book, Let Me Be a Woman and Passion and Purity. Side note, Passion and Purity came out long before Joshua Harris's book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, and she advocated for a lot more restriction than courtship. Carolyn Mahaney wrote a book I read several times called Feminine Appeal. I loved the blog she wrote with her daughters called Girl Talk. And Nancy Lee DeMoss Walgamuth, whom I have so much respect for, holds a conference every year called True Woman where she holds her banner high for complementarianism. These women and many others have given this kind of femininity the label of all labels. They called it biblical womanhood. Biblical womanhood is a theology about women that is derived from a very narrow understanding of Paul's theology on gender, from complementarianism. Essentially, we have used Paul to justify the gender roles of male headship and female submission. We also use Paul to justify homophobia, but that's for another episode. What does Paul's understanding of gender have to do with Eve? Everything. In Paul's first letter to a young pastor named Timothy, he wrote in chapter 2, verse 11, Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided that they, women, continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. End quote. So this is why. 
According to Paul, it is all about Eve. Eve was deceived and became the transgressor, not Adam. She will be saved through childbearing. That was a strange thing for Paul to write, since it is Paul who was so adamant that we are saved not by circumcision, but by faith alone, through grace alone, because of Christ alone. And yet Paul says women will be saved by childbearing. When I read that, I really wonder what he meant. Like, was am I supposed to take that literally? A couple years ago, I read it and I immediately went to John MacArthur's study Bible and looked up what John MacArthur had to say about the verse and how he explained it. In his footnote for 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, MacArthur wrote, While a woman may have led the human race into sin, women have the privilege of leading many out of sin to godliness. End quote. Essentially, what MacArthur is saying is that he believes women can lessen the effects of the fall, as depicted in Genesis 3, by raising children to love the Lord. What this kind of thinking does is it prioritizes being a mom over having a career. And so what this does is it creates a culture where women's sphere of influence is limited to the four walls of her home. We don't raise girls in the evangelical church to be strong, to think for themselves, and to navigate hard things. That's for men. And that's what masculinity is for. Women are to stay home so that they can do their job, lessening the effects of the fall by raising godly children. Think about how a literal view of Paul's thinking on gender affects how we navigate sexuality. Women were made for men. Women were made to sexually satisfy men. That's what's being preached, especially sub subtextually in our evangelical churches. On an extreme note, this is the theology that men use to justify the idea that married women cannot be raped. It feels extreme talking about it from this point of view, but when we constantly teach people that this is what they should believe, it is very easy for things to go wrong. For many women, Paul's words and a few other terrible passages in the Old Testament are why they do not read the Bible and never ever go to churches. Many women cannot see any justification for keeping women out of leadership, out of the pulpit, and it is Eve's story that fuels this. My goal in this episode is to help you take a closer look at Eve's story in order to help you consider Eve and gender differently. Whether you are a female identified person or not, this story has huge implications for how we understand gender and our relationship to God, and you don't want to miss it. And as always, everything I'm about to say is an offering. It is food for thought. My goal is to help you think differently about the Bible, gender, and your relationship to God. Before I begin with Eve, I want to take a step back and talk through one of my favorite stories in Greek mythology. I read it in middle school and I've always loved it. In Greek mythology, there is a myth the ancient Greeks used to explain why there are seasons. The story of Persephone, the Greek goddess, the daughter of Zeus, is the story of why we have seasons. Once upon a time, the Greek goddess Persephone was playing in a field full of flowers when Hades, the god of the underworld, abducted her to bring her to the underworld to be his bride. While she was down in the underworld, her mother searched for her everywhere, and when her mother realized that her husband, Zeus, had a part in the abduction, her mother was so devastated. Persephone's mother refused to let the earth produce fruit until her daughter was returned. While in the underworld, Persephone tasted a pomegranate, the fruit of Hades, and because she ate this fruit, sound familiar? She was forced to spend half of the year in the underworld with her husband, Hades, and the other half of the year on earth above ground. Each year when she returns from the underworld, spring begins and life returns back to the way it was before she was abducted. When Persephone returns, so do the flowers in the meadows and the leaves on the trees. This is why we have seasons. It's a really compelling story. It's also a myth. 
It's an old attempt to explain a natural phenomenon. If you have ever experienced any kind of loss or grief, you know what it's like to want nothing to bloom or for it to be overcast for the outside weather to match your mood within. But it's just a myth. We know we have seasons because of how our climate changes with the tilt of the earth as it rotates around the sun. It was created to explain something the Greeks needed an explanation for. Now, I don't know if Adam and Eve's story is a myth or if it literally happened. All of scripture, including this story and including Paul's point of view, is sacred. I believe that. But I do not believe that the story of Adam and Eve is allowed to be used to justify an idea that we are to subjugate women. In my opinion, the story of Adam and Eve is used a lot like the story of Persephone. Ancient Greeks used Persephone to explain seasons and our pastors use Eve to justify and explain patriarchy. But if we look at the Bible more closely, I don't believe complementarianism is a justifiable interpretation of what happened. The story of Eve begins in the second creation story, not in the first one. In the first creation story found in Genesis 1, we read all about God's perfection and order in creation. There is nothing about Eve or taking a, or a talking snake or even sin in the first creation story. It is in the second creation story we meet Eve, the mother of all creation, the one woman we all come from. In Genesis chapter 2, Eve is created because it is not good for that man or the earthling to be alone. The text says, I will make a helper as his partner. The Hebrew word for helper is a masculine noun, which means helper. The text goes on to say, the Lord put the earthling to sleep, took one of their ribs and made a woman. So it is with the creation of a woman, the earthling becomes male. I love the ending of Genesis 2 where it says, the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. We'll talk more about this concept later, but I truly believe this should be the goal for all human sexuality, that we are naked with another person and not ashamed. And what could be present with shame no longer in the picture? Without shame, there is love, joy, peace, patience in sexual intimacy, kindness in lovemaking, goodness and self-control, which are all fruits of the feminine Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm getting off tra track back to the Garden of Eden. Things start to fall apart with Adam and Eve right away in Genesis chapter 3 when the crafty serpent comes onto the scene. Many of us were told that the serpent was Satan. And we know from scripture that Satan is a fallen angel. If we take that literally, that means sin was already in the world long before Eve came. Satan had sinned and fallen from grace. It did not begin with Eve. All the serpent tried to do was to make Eve question God's word. Never mind the logic behind eating everything except from a random fruit tree. Eve was never to question God's word. It is not what God said, it is that God said it. Do you ever remember hearing that? It sounds a bit similar to when a parent says, do as I say, not as I do. But she did not listen. She questioned the word of God and the serpent encouraged it. The serpent said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Eve responded and said, God said that if we ate from that tree, we will surely die. The serpent replied, you shall not surely die for God knows. And this is where the serpent speaks on behalf of God. A very dangerous thing to do, whether you are a talking snake or not. And he said, God surely knows that once you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. End quote. Think about that for a minute. Since when is being like God, pursuing godliness, a bad thing? I imagine that Eve, since she had walked with God and knew God, that she wanted to be like God and didn't see a problem in making a choice that would make her more like God. 
Many evangelical pastors preach that Eve's sin did not begin with taking the fruit from the forbidden tree. Her sin, many say, began when she questioned the very word of God. But questioning and doubting, that can't be a sin because the entire book of Job and a huge chunk of the Psalms is about questioning the character and promises of God. The book of Job is an exquisitely dark but wonderfully helpful book for anyone who is suffering. In Job, the man repeatedly questions God for why he has to endure such loss, such pain, and such terrible suffering. In Job chapter 9, Job said, How then can I answer him? Meaning God. How then can I answer him? Choosing my words with him. Though I am innocent, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. And Job assumed he was being accused by God for something, something he did wrong. Though I am innocent, I cannot answer him. I must appeal for mercy to my accuser. If I am summoned by him and he answered me, I do not believe that he would listen to my voice. End quote. I mean, that is a pretty heavy doubt in the love and goodness of God. But we've all been there. And even the most pious of theologians have been there. We know what it means to suffer and to wonder, where is God? It is not a sin to ask that question. It is not a sin to question God's word. It is not a sin to wonder how God could allow so many evangelicals to preach such toxic theology. It is not a sin to question the very foundations of your faith. It is not a sin to deconstruct and unlearn harmful theology. It is healthy and normal to doubt. It is healthy and normal to examine your beliefs. It is completely understandable to go through hard things and ask, where is God? Even Jesus asked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so Eve took a piece of fruit and ate it. And the text says in verse six that she also gave some to her husband who was there with her and he ate it. This is where we get the doctrine of original sin or the belief that sin originated with Adam and Eve. And because of this original sin, human beings are born in sin and destined to sin. This is where the story gets kind of like Persephone for me. As soon as they eat the fruit, God supposedly cursed all humanity through Adam and Eve. Genesis 3 chapter 16 says, God supposedly cursed Eve by saying, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbirth. In pain, you shall bring forth children, end quote. Okay, so that's why it hurts when we push an eight-pound baby through our vaginas. There could be no other reason for that pain, right? <laughs> the next curse to Eve was, and I quote, Your desire shall be for your husband, and you shall rule over, and he shall rule over you, end quote. Because of Eve, women are to be subject to their husbands or male authority. Women will want to naturally usurp male authority, but he shall rule over you. God supposedly said this, the God who visited the woman at the well, who cured little girls, who healed bleeding women, the God who allowed women first to discover that he rose from the grave, that same God cursed all women. Now I know you're thinking, Jesus did all those things, not God, the Father, the God present in the moment of this Bible story. Jesus said some really important things that I, and one in particular that I want you to carry with you whenever you read the Bible or hear a sermon or read a Christian book. In John chapter 14, verse nine, Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. Hebrews chapter one, verse three explains it a different way. The author wrote that Jesus Christ is the reflection, I quote, the reflection of God's glory in the exact imprint of God's very being, end quote. So if what you read in the Old Testament does not align with the Jesus of the Gospels, it is not a correct depiction of God. If Jesus is the exact representation of the Father, then we only take literally that which aligns with the goodness and mercy and love of Christ in the Gospels. 
Jesus did not curse women or treat them as subhuman or lower class people. Jesus went out of his way to visit a non-Jewish woman at the well and to share with her gospel truth. Jesus healed little girls and bleeding women. Jesus invited women to be part of his gospel story as they graced him with perfume and gave all that they had for his kingdom. Jesus revealed the power of the resurrection to women first. That doesn't mean women are better than men. That means Jesus actively tried to deconstruct the very misogyny that humans live with and that have derived from their interpretation of scripture. Jesus is the exact representation of God and the exact representation of God of the Old Testament. And if what the Old Testament says does not align with the character of Christ, it should not be taken literally. The next curse was directed at Adam and listen closely, I quote, and to the man, God supposedly said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, cursed is the ground because of you. End quote. Because you listened to your wife? Because you listened to your wife, because you let her lead you, because you get, you've given her some authority over you, cursed is the ground because of you. Now I ask, does Eve's punishment fit her crime? I don't think so. The part of Eve's story that I can't ever really get over is that the entire female species was cursed because she ate a piece of fruit. I mean, it's completely absurd. What is so special about this fruit? What does that particular fruit have to do with human relationships and human flourishing? If a piece of fruit can cause so much harm, why isn't all fruit banned? Telling Eve she can't eat fruit from that tree is like telling someone you can do whatever you want, just don't touch that chair or don't touch that cup. Because to do so would cause the condemnation of all women forever. But the point of the story is trying to illustrate so much more than just the fruit. It's that she questioned what God said and went against what God said. It is not what God said, it is that he said it that is so important. Eve's story not only condemns all women to subjugation, it elevates whatever is perceived to be God's word, and it ultimately leads to blind obedience to a literal interpretation of scripture. This is why so many people have used the Bible to justify slavery and war. If it's in the Bible, it's justifiable because we don't question what God said. Never mind the rest of scripture or church history or our personal experience or reason. Hello, Wesleyan quadrilateral. <laughs> we do whatever our pastor says because it's in the Bible. Now consider the story of Cain and Abel. Does Cain's punishment fit his crime? In Genesis 4, it says Cain, and I quote, brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he, meaning God, had no regard, end quote. And what did Cain do out of his jealousy? He killed his brother. He murdered his brother out of jealous rage. This is what I believe to be the first original sin. I don't believe we are born in sin and are destined to sin. But if we had to point to a original sin or a point in history where everything began to fall apart, I would point to this, Cain killing Abel. Murder is sin. Eating fruit is not. In killing his brother, Cain extinguished life. The story, for me, helps define sin in a much healthier way than the idea that anything can be sin because we think God said it. Anything that tries to extinguish life, gossip, slander, bullying, hatred, abuse, sexual violence, I mean, fill in the blank. Anything that tries to prohibit human flourishing is far more of a concern than a piece of fruit. But what does the text say that God supposedly did? Genesis chapter 4 verse 15 says, And the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Whoever kills Cain will suffer sevenfold vengeance. 
Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. End quote. I ask again, does the punishment fit the crime? Eve takes a piece of fruit, and now the entire female species is cursed. Cain kills his brother, and he gets a hedge of protection around him, to the point that God supposedly promises to make someone suffer sevenfold should they hurt Cain. Does the punishment fit the crime? It certainly does not. Many scholars believe that Paul was speaking to a problem happening in Timothy's church when he wrote in 1 Timothy, I permit no women to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent for Adam was formed first than Eve and Adam was not deceived but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Scholars believe that Paul didn't mean for this to apply to all women. How do we know that? We look at the other parts of Paul's writing. The easiest place to look at is Romans 16. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote a chapter, chapter 16, where in verse 1 he writes, I, and I quote, I commend you to our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church, end quote. The original Greek word for deacons means one who executes the commands of another, a servant, attendant, minister. In verse 3, it says, Greet Prissa and Aquila, who risk their necks for my life. Greet also the church in their house. Verse 6, Greet Mary, who has worked very hard among you. Greet Adronicus, which is a male name, and greet Junia, a female name, my relatives who were in prison with me. They are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. End quote. To use a couple of passages in Paul to justify the subjugation of women is to pick and choose what you take literally. It's to ignore Romans 16 and other areas where he esteems and celebrates the efforts of women in the church. If we take the story of Eve literally, her story is a really, really compelling argument for patriarchy because it establishes within the reader that it's not what God said, it's that he said it. And the mistakes of men, the sins of men, even if they murder their brothers, well, they get a hedge of protection over them. For men were created in the image of God and women the image of men. It's a very compelling argument for patriarchy, but it contradicts so much of the love and respect God has given to women all throughout scripture. From Deborah, the judge, to Abigail, to Miriam, to Mary, to the women at the well, and to the women apostles. God has a high view of women, and so should we. Beth Moore is one of the most prominent Bible teachers in the entire evangelical church. Her Bible studies written for women are and have been wildly popular and sell very well. I have been reading Beth Moore's books and doing her Bible studies for years since I was a teenager. And her work always gave me a fresh love for scripture. Shortly after the Me Too movement, where women came forth in solidarity and spoke up about the sexual abuse of men prominent in the entertainment industry, there was a hashtag Church Too movement where evangelical women came forth about the incredible abuse they endured from men in their church. In 2019, about three years after the Church Too movement, Beth Moore announced at the Southern Baptist Convention that she no longer believed in complementarianism because of the abuse it creates and protects. In her speech, she calls out the hypocrisy of evangelicals who condemn egalitarianism or the idea that we are all equal regardless of our gender. But for now, listen to Beth Moore's words at the Southern Baptist Convention in 2019. Does complementarian theology cause abuse? The answer is no. Sin and gross selfishness in the human heart cause abuse. Demonic influences cause abuse. However, has a culture prevalent in various circles of the SBC formed and burgeoned out of it, contributed to it? Absolutely and heavily. And I ask you to hear me out on it, even if you could not disagree. 
agree more. Even if I thought you were sitting over coffee late tonight talking about how you didn't like it, I would know you were talking about it. Because see, the world is watching to see if we will bring up what they believe is the biggest elephant in the room. Yes. Complementary theology became such a high core value that it inadvertently, by proof of what we have seen, look at the fruit of what happened, became elevated above the safety and well-being of many women. So high a core value has it become that in much of our world, complementary theology is now conflated with inerrancy. Case in point, notice how often our world charges or dismisses egalitarians by saying they have a low view of scripture. Because unless they think like us about complementary theology, they do not honor the word of God. Good. Watch for it. Test it and see if it is so. Far too many SBC congregations and SBC seminaries, so few women are in any visible area of leadership that women who are being abused by the system itself or within it, by people that are in places of power, don't even have a female to turn to. That's right. They don't even know where to go. Yeah. Here's the best way I know to put it. If complementarianism were a woman, I tell you that woman is being abused and somebody needs to call the police and start an investigation. Come on. And God help us if the police are in on it. Regardless of what you believe about Adam and Eve, whether it literally happened or it's a myth, the story is not a logical basis for which we can condemn all women to the subjugation of women. We cannot pick and choose what to take literally with Paul. If Jesus is the exact representation of God, then we filter everything through the Christ of the Gospels. We must use the Wesleyan quadrilateral, scripture, tradition, experience, and reason to support only that which inspires the fruits of the Spirit. We need to stop abusing Eve's story and start respecting the voices, concerns, and leadership of women, no matter what they did or their social status, or if we find what they said uncomfortable. Because the oppression of some inevitably leads to the subjugation of others. And as James Baldwin famously said, we cannot be free until we are all free. Thank you for joining me again on another episode of the Unlearning Podcast. I want to invite you to hit the subscribe button and to write a rating or a review. And if this episode has been particularly helpful for you, please share it with others. It's important we help each other along our journey of deconstruction. I know the bricks.